All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays at the barn until Dad and I came along. Now we're just going to let it all out for you guys. So today is a very special episode because today is Torque's birthday. We got a birthday episode, birthday special. I should have a sombrero. You should. We can need a mariachi band to get in here and start <laughs> singing. But Free fried ice cream. He doesn't even look 50. I don't think you guys have ever seen Torque without his beard on his face. That nasty old crusty beard. That's I'm clean. gray. Well, I'm not as clean shaven as I was, but... Yeah, I'm pretty much clean shaven. I got chastised a little bit from that. So you looking you're you're looking young and spry. I'm feeling pretty spry. Yeah. I got uh taken for a ride yeah what yesterday morning. We loaded pigs and I got knocked on my arse, uh, but nobody saw me. So yeah, it was I, okay. I was in the pen getting the pigs out, so I didn't see it. I our buddy help, my buddy Kale, he might have saw it because No, nope, he didn't see he it. He didn't see it. Neither either. did the trucker. So then I felt okay. I felt really bad. I hit the ground and thumped my head a little bit. You felt the pain, but you didn't feel the pain of embarrassment. Right. That's exactly right. It's a double hitter if you get people watching you mess up too. I quick looked around and nobody saw me. So then I just, I got up really quickly. I got, (laughs) I got my wits about me and went back at it. So there you go. And I can still walk the next day. And he hit his head and dad's hit his head many, many times. He's, I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get into the stories today. Could be the day we get into the stories, but You've cracked your head, I don't know how many times. and you, I don't know, so many that I can't remember now. All that lead paint you've eaten too probably didn't help, and it's yeah. just, I don't know. But we did a lot this week. I don't know, it was kind of a kind of a blur. We always talk about what we did. It's been, it's like we said last time, this is the time of year that it's kind of whirlwind. Yeah. The weather's been crap, just it absolute has, crap. It has been crappy, for but sure. It's turning, it's getting a little, it's finally getting back to warm. Still it, haven't side dressed yet. We're, it's too, no, too, it's too wet. damp, too wet out there, so we can't get out there. I'm thinking probably next week. Tuesday. we I won't get a rig on Memorial Day, but we'll get one Tuesday, and if it doesn't rain between now and then, we should be able to go. Yeah, that's good. I got an upcoming trip coming up with the with my boys. Me, we always have a annual Brozarks trip in the, in the Ozarks, and a bunch of my friends from high school and people we've met from college go down there and or I've met when I go up to college campuses and we all go down there and have fun and we're going to have four days in the, in the Ozarks with the bros. So it's kind of my vacation. It's my vacation in my early twenties. Someday I think I'll have to probably give up Ozarks and spend, go on a vacation with my wife, you know, so. If she'll keep you. If she'll keep me. If I can, if I can, cat, I think cat, I think cat, yeah, she might be. She might be the. She's gonna be the one. Probably. You better be careful. This is going but, out over the airwaves. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, she can stand with me for for a little bit longer. Anyway, but yeah, I'll have to take her probably somewhere instead of having to go to the annual Bros Arcs. But I'm gonna enjoy every second of it. It's been a, it's been a long year. So and last year I got salmonella down in the in the Ozarks. So my Ozarks trip last year was Not horrible. Good. I was getting. So I was sick, and then, you know, you got a bunch of kids, young kids in their 20s that are drinkers and go to college and are full of testosterone. Trying to get you to do trying this. Trying to get me to get up and stop being a stop being a wuss. Get up. Get up. Yeah. And then, you know, me being bold and dumb, I'd get up and I'd try, and then that just made it worse. So And full-blown COVID going. At yeah. the, oh, let's see. Was that? I don't know. It might have just been starting. I, yeah, I don't I, think I don't, it was going it's, hard This yet. whole COVID thing, I just, it's a blur. But anyway, yeah. this year I'm hoping it'll be better for me. But that's that's what's coming up. So dad's going to have to run the side, run the side dress uh, rig by himself. And hopefully... Yeah, I can do that. And I want you to go and have a good time and don't worry about a thing and just know that I'll get the corn side dress. And other than that, nothing will get done. Hopefully you just get, get the vlogging too. I'll try to do some vlogging. Dad's got to do the vlogging. We got to get we got to get some content for the This Will Do Farm Channel. It's an, it's a never ending. It's a never content, never ending content warfare. With you know, some sometimes you really just don't want to whip out the camera, but 
kind of have to, you know, you gotta, you gotta make it. So yep, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, it's getting easier. I'm putting it on you. It is getting easier. Two years ago, I was awkward as shit on camera. Now, now yeah. you're just awkward. Now I'm just awkward. That's right. What do you got for a market update? Well, and while you're doing this, this wouldn't be a birthday special edition of Barn Talk if there wasn't something special to go with it. So while you're doing this, I'm going to go get up and get you something. <laughs> So you okay. give them the market update. All right. and I'll be right back. I'll give you. I'll give them the market update. I'm scared. I'm a little. I'm a little bit scared now. Um, it, really, for all of the all the up and down, the markets this week we're not that far off of where we were. Um, corn delivered to one of the feeders around here is six ninety eight, and that's a Friday. And um, beans fifteen thirty seven on one side of the river and 1559 on the other side of the river and uh we last time we talked we were talking about the idea whether uh lean hogs would go higher than cattle and they did they closed friday at a buck 17 a pound and, and uh fat cattle closed at 115 so i don't know when the last time that happened but and there was i was reading there were some packers out that were paying a buck 20 to get pigs before the weekend uh last week so crazy um feeder cattle buck 50 i was trying to find somewhere a price on what somebody was paying for wiener pigs but i couldn't find one i'm sure it's outrageous or feeder pigs there must not be any so it's pretty high <laughs> um the crypto market not good not good not good at stocks all stocks aren't good either no stocks have been bad for a while yeah just kind of they're just kind of playing a holding game but Man, crypto had a big sell-off. Um, Bitcoin, I think, got down to somewhere around 32. 32. 32.5, maybe? Is it? Is that 34 now? It's at 34.4 as of Friday afternoon. Ethereum's at 22, and I don't know what all the rest. But Those are the only two we really track right now. Yeah, They're not on much the else. Radar. Um, but the thing about, I think, where people get a little caught up in that price, with Bitcoin... You're, you're pricing that off of the dollar, and the price is as much a reflection of what's going on in the dollar as it is with what's going on in Bitcoin. And what you really have to look at is the total, the total market value. Like, um, if, if the size of the market of Bitcoin is growing, um, price isn't as big a concern because in the long run, if you're a hodler, it doesn't matter because in the long run, it's going to win out. But right. um, I mean, it's still over a trillion dollars. It it actually dipped down a little. I think it got a little below a trillion dollars in market cap. I think I saw something say it's the fastest growing asset. Yeah, that's. Ever, I mean, it's it gone is. to a trillion dollar market cap, the fastest than Google, faster than Google, Amazon, Microsoft, all those companies. Or I don't know if all those are trillion dollar companies, but the no. of the trillion dollar companies, Bitcoin surpassed them by like ten years. Yeah. Of well, being the fastest growing, and this and this downturn, um, there's a lot of institutional investors that are buying it up. They're mm -hmm. buying it cheap. Um, that's the thing. When people, when people panic and people sell, somebody's buying. And what did Claude Griner always tell you? <laughs> Claude Griner told me a lot of things, but he always told me that when everybody was scared and everybody was selling. Well, actually, he said that when everything's going up and everybody's buying and it's high, 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 he goes, that's when you shouldn't be buying. And you should be doing what? Holding. And? Holding and saving. Because when everything went down, that's the time to buy. He said, why buy it high when you can buy it on sale? But you got, you got to be really patient to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people that are patient and they're buying now. Um, well, there's a lot of people that aren't either. Yeah, true, true. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's, it's the same because there's a lot of people that sold out. Well, actually, when the, when the big drop was, there are a bunch of people that um, were speculating, mm. and they got sold out because they were trading on margin. And mm. trading on margin buying um, crypto futures is no different than trading on margin, you know, in the commodities or in stocks or anything else. And mm -hmm. they lost their margin and they got sold out. And so. Yeah, you can get 
you can get upside down in a hurry. Yeah, I think I talked about this last episode, but you just really, when you buy an asset, when you buy real estate, when you buy crypto, when you buy a stock, you need to, you gotta, you gotta have a belief in it that what it's about instead of the hype around it. Because if you believe what it's about is good and you think it's going to work in the future and it's going to be an innovative thing that's going to be around for a long time, that's what's going to keep you staying and holding your money when everyone else is selling. Yeah, you know what? Or your crypto or your real estate or whatever. That might be one of the reasons why... Um, gotta believe what you Gotta believe what you're buying. Yes. Yeah. worthwhile. I think that might be one of the reasons why farmers... Um, end up in the long run doing as well as they can because if you buy farmland, you no matter what you're not going to sell it, <laughs> even when you want to, even when it's really oh, bad. You just rent it out. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you're in it for the long run, right? And the up right. and down, and over time, it pays it's off. It's going to pay. And That's hog right. building is the same way. Once you sign your your name on the dotted line, you're pretty much you're pretty much on right or wrong. And you know what? Uh, I can speak to this because this is kind of along the lines. Um, ten years goes pretty fast, and the the ten years between your forties and your fifties go a hell of a lot faster than the ten between your thirties and your twenties and the twenties your twenties and thirties. I mean it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think yeah, I think uh, real estate and farming it's kind of in your control, you know, with the stocks and crypto. I mean, it yeah. is in your control how much you buy and whatever, if you hold it or sell it. Right. But it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier because you're not, you're not so tied to it. It's a lot easier to panic and it's a lot easier to take the quick right. buck. But when you own something, when you own yeah. a piece of real estate, own a piece of ground, there's power in putting your back up against the yeah. wall. <laughs> Because yeah, you'll make is. it work when when it'll do whatever it takes. Yep. You'll you'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. So that's there's, absolutely there's, right. There's power in that. But yeah, I did forgot to say what how old dad is gonna how da, how old dad is today. How old are you? I am fifty. It's the big five zero. The big five zero. And I ha, I bought these gifts. I've been sitting on these gifts, and we were gonna. <laughs> I've been waiting for the right time, and I thought, well, no better time than shooting live barn talk to give I'm a me, little I'm a little on edge give you these gifts and show everybody you know that I'm not a terrible son and I I do some nice things for you this once is, in a while this is actually very impressive because one you remembered my birthday yep two you didn't procrastinate uh to where fast shipping couldn't save you because you've done that before right. where uh you just assumed that you could get next day shipping mm-hmm. and Three, you planned far enough ahead that you had it and actually had it up here, and I didn't even know you had it. So that's right. Kudos to you. I'm getting wiser in my <laughs> old age. I'm getting up. I'm getting up there in the brain power. But nice. before we give you this gift, why don't you show what a what a fan gave you? What yeah, it gave us. So uh, my wife. So uh, the mercantile. What's what's the, what's her Instagram handle? The mercantile. Yeah. The mercantile. Yeah. I think it's the mercantile on Marion. Is her, is her Instagram yeah, you handle. can probably look it up. It'll pop up. Yeah. So anyway, um, she she uh, schemed with everybody, and I had a little bit of a surprise party at, at a brewery uh, last night, and I was surprised because we've got a lot of stuff going on this weekend, and um, we're all pretty busy, and it just looked like it wasn't going to work to really do a whole lot, which I was fine with. Um, I was a little irked because you weren't going to your favorite restaurant. I wasn't going to my favorite restaurant to get my pork ribeye. Um, but other than that, I'm a team player. So. All dad knew was it was going to be the, the close niche family. It was just going right. to be six of us, but we were scheming. We had it. We knew we had a show out for the big five Oh, and we, <laughs> we shoot through a surprise party. We had people come out to the brewery, stand up, drink and have a good old time. And yeah. I actually, I'm, I did show, I showed the sign of my age because I was trying to work the room because everybody that, you know, showed up and kept showing up after dinner and all that, um, you know, they were all there to say happy birthday to me. So I was trying to work the room and get to everybody. And about the time that, uh, it was starting to wind down, I was, I was tired. I felt like that I was back at World Pork Expo. Uh, trying to make every sale I could. And I told Trish, I said, I'm about tired of talking. So I slept good. 
So you got something from a fan yeah, that watches so, the show at that surprise party. Yeah, so a good friend of ours, Realtor. Shout out to, you want to show that camera yeah. right there. Shout out to Jenny Morgan. Jenny Morgan, shout out to you. Realtor extraordinaire. This is, this is um, this, I was super like blown away because it's, I think yeah. it's a it's a really heartfelt gift. Yeah, they did a good job. They on did it. a damn good so, job. So show that camera too. Show them there. So this is the this will do this will do farm pod stars. We're yeah. the podcaster stars. <laughs> Don't get it twisted with porn star. We're pod stars out here. Yeah, there you go. So we got to find a good place. We're gonna have to start uh, a wall. We got to have a wall of. You know what's funny? You last episode you said send us some snacks. Yeah, there you go. Send us some snacks. Well, Jenny, you did better than send us some snacks. You you gave us some. Memorabilia, memorabilia, we can, I can't say that. Say word. that one more time. I can't really say that word. I'm not going to embarrass myself, but we got something to hang on the wall. Mementos. We've got some mementos <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, we got something to hang up on the wall. So, so I, thanks to Jenny. Thanks to Jenny. Pat, Jenny. Okay, so now you guys seen that awesome gift from one of the fans. Now we got this big hunk right here. Oh, so boy. We're just going to cut to the wide shot. So okay. we'll, right here, we'll just... All right. Open that. I'm gonna up. tip it because I'm short. Yeah, I can't see. Go ahead and tip it. It looks like white tissue. Ignore the if you're listening to this on audio. Oh, here's the card. I don't know. That's I got kind of heartfelt there. So am I supposed to read it out loud? Or uh, is this for private? That's I, for private. I, I, I think that's for private. Yeah. Ah, uh, nice, nice, nice. If you're listening on audio version, that is the wrapping inside the gift that I give you. Yes. Dad. So this, that's an awesome hat. It's hey. sh- show them what's on the front of it. A big old American hog. Patriotic hog. And on the side of it, it says, take pride in your cue, as in barbecue. And Heck yeah. I like that a lot. Dad likes to smoke his meats. That's a nice, that's a nice hat. Nice hat. Good job. Yep. I'll wear that with pride. Ah, uh, yes. You can't go wrong with this. I did. I did. You did request a different kind. I got, you said barbecue, hot barbecue, and... The Mexican seasoning one. Yeah. And I got you that. But, you know, these are more expensive. So yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get him the Caribbean. He can get barbecue whenever he wants. So uh, damn good seasonings, everybody. Damn yeah. good. If you are a fan of barbecue and, and you haven't seen how to barbecue right, uh, that guy does a really good He does job. it right. <laughs> he does. Um, I haven't... Anything that I've made that... I've watched him make. And he's, that's, got a, he's got a YouTube channel. Yeah, he's got a great YouTube channel. Anyway, um, he's single-handedly probably done more for, our bar, for my barbecue game than anybody else just yeah. from watching his videos. Shout so, out to Malcolm Reed. Yeah. I don't know if you'll be watching, but if you are, <laughs> yeah, shout Mal- out to you, buddy. Malcolm Reed, is he's the man. He's the man. So, And I got you something special here. I think you gotta, you got to have some apparel while you're, while you're that. smoking and seasoning the meats. You got to read the front of it. So it says, I like pig butts, and I cannot lie, and that That's is right. true. That That's is so right. true. Show them, show them it up. You got to lift the front up. There you go. Oh, I'm trying to maneuver my mic. There you go. So, yeah, awesome. There you go. I got you all decked out for your <laughs> smoker so you can okay. make, make me some good food. Well, <laughs> Memorial Day is... Memorial Day is coming up. That's yep. right. And there are there's a... There's a two pack of pork butts sitting in the refrigerator right now. So that's right. We'll probably put those on bright and early. You want me to take these off, or do we want to just have them sitting there? They, can, I don't care. They can sit there. All right, all right. It doesn't it? Doesn't. It's matter. up to you if you want to read the card. Just know it's, it's sentimental. I'll wait. Okay. I'll wait. Well, so there's the gift given. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a special edition if we didn't have something special for Torque. So this is Torque's special edition. So that's kind of getting us to what we're going to talk about today. You're going to get to know Torque like you've never known him before. You're going to know his whole story on how we got to be where we are today. And it was <sighs> a very long journey, but... A long and twisted journey. Long and twisted journey, but here we are. Yeah. So you're going to get all the ins and outs of that today. Well... Take it away. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of our family history and my dad and his adventures and... Um, you know, you know that I came along, uh, late in life for him, but, um, so I'm a child of the seventies and eighties. I was born in 1971 and, um, it's, it's crazy to me when I think about raising our kids 
um, no cell phones, you know, and we would go, we would go out and we started with BMX bikes, me and my, me and my friends. And then we graduated to three wheelers and dirt bikes. I still, I still never ridden one of those and I would love to. Probably good. They, they got kind of a bad rap, but death trap. Yeah, they were kind of a death trap, but, um, I guess back up a little bit. So something kind of, kind of crazy that I really think when I look back, um, had a lot of influence on how, probably how I turned out is the fact that in our little neighborhood, there were, there were five boys and I, this is before I got to, to like junior high, but just in, in this neighborhood here in about a, let's just say in about a five mile radius. Um, my two best friends, we were all the youngest of at least three boys. Some of them had a sister in there, but I was the youngest of three boys. And there was a pretty good gap between um, the next brother and them, just like there was a gap between me. And we were all the youngest. Um, I had one friend that had a sister that was younger than he was, but then I had two other friends that I was pretty good, that we were, we were pretty good friends. They lived a little further away, but it was the same deal with them. They were the youngest of four. And the, the product of that is that you end up with parents that have all raised two or three kids ahead of you. And by that time, by the time you come along, they're just tired. And they probably let a little more slide than what they did with the first one. <laughs> they're beaten down. Yeah, they're just, they're pretty much beaten down. And then not only that, but you have the benefit of watching your brothers and sisters, and you can kind of sit there and see, oh, well, that worked pretty good. That was <laughs> that was a pretty good sales job on that deal on to go to that movie or to go to this person's house, or, ooh, no, that was bad. That went too far. That okay. approach was yeah, not good. That wasn't a good approach. We won't use that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't think people give kids enough credit, but when you watch, they may not say anything, but they watch. And um, we all pretty much had it figured out. And as I said, we were the generation... The 80s was, you know, I think everybody thinks that the generation or the, or the period of time that they, that they grew up and went through middle school and high school, they probably all think that it was the best time ever. And I'm certainly no different, but I really feel like, well, I'll just tell you, I go, I talk to people and you run into people and inevitably you end up talking about, you know, high school or college. And there's a lot of people that don't have good experiences with high school. You know, they were a late bloomer or they were, you know, they had goofy teeth or they had goofy hair. <laughs> They're just awkward. And, you know, it takes a while to figure it out. And I'm, I'm certainly that way. Um, but I was very insecure. Um, but I was lucky in the fact that I had these friends that I grew up with that we were we were together all the way through and we all kind of had that bond we all had that in common and um man i we had a really good time <laughs> i mean we had a really good time um none of us were what i would say were overachievers you when guys I, they, that, yeah academically i don't think we were and we'll get into that but man we had a good time well even with my friends, you know, my friends, their dads grew up in the eighties too. And you know, all your stories that you've told us and my friends, their dads that tell yeah. them their stories, we're all envious of the eighties. Well, and we all are, we all know <laughs> the eighties was probably the best damn time to grow up and yeah. live through that because you, yeah. you had enough leeway, you could get away with things and it wasn't a huge deal. Yeah. And you didn't have cell phones, which we've talked about cell phones are great. Technology is great, but the fact that you had to get out of your house and cruise the lanes and meet up with people, and that was the only way you knew what was going on, and you weren't on social media, and the memories were that you made were just here. Yep. They weren't on your phone, which it's nice to see them and look back on it, but I bet it was also nice that, you know, what happened happened, and 
you can yeah. you can miscue the story however you want. Yeah, I mean that's the greatest <laughs> thing about it. Um, everything that we went through, uh, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, <laughs> because there's very little photographic evidence of any of the stuff that we might or might not have done. And um, it was the '80s were a time where the technology seemed like it was just coming so fast, and we had all this cool stuff. Um, but you didn't have, you didn't have the disconnection that you have today as far as everybody was still really, really social. Um, so like music, MTV was huge and, um, I was a poor Money country. for nothing. Yeah. Chicks for free. Chicks for free. And, um, I was one of the poor country kids that didn't have cable. And so all I had was Friday night videos. Um, but I love going into town to my friend's places and watching MTV. I just thought it was great, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't have it 24 seven, like a lot of them did, but you know, there was so much commonality because, and I talked to Sawyer about this all the time, how his generation, you know, you listen to songs and you don't, you kind of sample them. Like you don't mm -hmm. even listen to a whole song. You like, you really like the, the chorus, so you listen to that, and then you're on to the next thing. My yeah. my generation was like, if you if you really like John Cougar, you had to go buy the album, and there wasn't any skip on a turntable. Now, my brother's generation was more the out, you know, albums were so cassettes had kind of taken over by the time I got to where I was driving, but even then. You know, you had to inv you had to invest either money or time yeah. into making that soundtrack. Like for cassettes, can yeah, you can make a mixtape? Can make a mixtape, and with the records, you purchase the records. So damn it, you're going to listen to the whole yeah. record for. Oh yeah, I, I I envy that a little bit too because you know you were stuck with it and you really had to listen to a whole album. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so probably my senior year in high school, um, Guns and Roses' "Appetite for Destruction" is probably the only cassette that I literally wore out and bought twice because I had a copy in my car and I had a copy at home and the one in my car once in a while you might have pulled it out for ACDC back in black oh or yeah, yeah. or Steve Miller band if you were feeling if you were feeling uh kind of nostalgic you'd pop in some Steve Miller but appetite for destruction that was I graduated in 89 and I mean that was like and but the thing was that was like the amount of commonality between you would go to a party, and so the way you knew there was a party was all your friends, we would we would call, you know, we'd, we'd either, we would call each other, um, but we would meet at somebody's house and then pile into one car or maybe two cars if we had some extra people that were, you know, fringe friends that weren't with us all the time. But by the time I was in high school, I had I had six guys that, we hung around all the time, but we would, you didn't know what was going on. So you would literally go cruise the four lanes. And in our little town, there was a high V, there was a grocery store at one end. And at the other end, um, there was a fast food restaurant and you'd go around the block at the fast food rant, uh, restaurant and then back to the grocery store. And that parking lot, that was the hub that of was information the spot. That was where you figured out what was going on. And if nobody was there, you missed out. You really screwed up because <laughs> uh, all the information had been put out and you weren't there to get so it. So if you got there and showed up and you all got the plan, would you just convoy out there? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of parties out, you know, in somebody's field or some, some park or some, you know, somewhere, somebody's barn, somebody's machine shed, whatever. Um, and that was the, that was the the pastime, but it, what was interesting about that was that, you know, as I like we were talking about music, everybody had, everybody had that. Song. There was a, what I liked about the eight, and this is with music. There was a, like, it was what was popular, and that was it. Like yep. pop music in the eighties was pretty much rock music, yeah, and that was the music to listen to. Yep. Now, oh wow, my voice just went. I don't know what <laughs> happened there. Uh, now. You have all kinds of different genres you can listen to, and there's not like the there's not like the genre to listen to, right. which is it's good. It's nice, but I wish there was kind of like the genre to listen to back when I was in high school. Because yeah. I mean, it, there was 
we listened to rap and hip hop and country and whatever, but yeah. that was nice. But everyone kind of shared the same thing as what yeah, you're saying. It was just a piece of commonality that everybody kind of had. And um, so in, a, in my situation, it's just crazy to me. So when I was 12, I think I was probably, maybe I was only 10, I got my first three-wheeler. I had a three-wheeler. I had a a Honda 110, which looked like now you see Shriners when, driving them in parades. But I got that, and um, one of my friends, he got a three-wheeler, and then my other friend had a dirt bike. And then um, we all moved up as we got a little older. I got a 185, and then the 185 wasn't fast enough. So one of my buddies, his brother was going to um, – like Wyotech, like to work on motorcycles. And so I bought a kit and we bored it out and we ported it and we put a bigger carburetor on it. And so my dad, I couldn't finagle a way to buy a 200 X. So I bored a 185 out to make it like a 200 <laughs> warp the head ended up ruining it. And, uh, <laughs> I sold that off and I finally got a 250 R a Honda ATC 250 R. And that was the epitome of that was the that was the the top dog in the three wheeler in game. the three wheel three wheeler game. Honda tried to make a three fifty X, and that was right at the end when I think all the lawsuits were starting <laughs> because that was when the four wheelers came out, and yep. eventually that killed the three wheelers. But I had a two fifty R, and it had a four inch extended or it had a six inch extended swing arm, four inch extended Dura Blue axles, and it had flat track tires on it. And that thing was just, it was, oh man, it was fun. It was so much fun. And in the summertime, this would have been between, this probably would have been about when we were 13, 14 years old. We couldn't drive. We had we had uh, school permits, but we couldn't really drive. We did drive a little bit, <laughs> but we couldn't really drive. <laughs> and, you know, we would we would get our work done. We were all farm kids. We'd get our work done, and then... Um, we would just go to each other's houses, find, you know, somebody show up at my house. So I had a pool, um, which was, um, I don't know how that, well, I think basically how that happened was that my dad got tired of us all going to town and he figured he could get more work out of us if he put a pool in. So he did that uh, when I was fairly young. But so that was pretty nice because um, you could, you could lure you could lure young ladies over to your house, even when you probably weren't you weren't the you weren't exactly the the hottest thing on the planet. I don't think I was probably a little chubby. I think, but anyway, you could yeah, I I could get a few girls to come over once in a while. But anyway, we would go to each other's houses or we'd go fishing. And the thing is, when I talk about cell phones, my parents didn't know where. None of our parents knew where we were for I don't know. Six your, six hours a day. Mm-hmm. I mean, we would try to get our work done, and if I could if I could guilt my dad into just letting me not have to do anything in the afternoon, unless we were bailing hay or it was you know fall, spring, whatever, where we had a lot of work to do. But if I could get my pig work done, I mean, we were gone all afternoon, and we were going. You know, we went like I said, we went fishing, we went we went all over, and there was only one time that we left, and we went up to the English River, which is probably about, I don't know, it's probably about 10 or 12 miles as the crow flies. I remember I had to strap two, two and a half gallon gas jugs on my 250R because it burned so much gas that if I, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to make it home because when we got up there, the, the river was low and we were out riding the sand, the sand in the, in the river. But anyway, my mom actually called the sheriff because it was like eight. Thir- it was like getting dark, and we got home. And that was the only time where uh, I think everybody's parents called each other because they were afraid. You know, what they had no idea where we were. Mm-hmm. But that was just the that was the norm. That was the norm. That's just what it was. And then um, we all, once again, commonality. We you know we sat around and we all liked hot rod magazines. You know, when we were 12, 13 years old, we were all like, oh, yeah, we wanted a Camaro or we wanted a Chevelle or we wanted a we wanted a Challenger. Mm-hmm. And as we started turning 16... Um, Everybody's goal was to get one of those yep. babies. And being farm kids, we all worked and we all saved money and we had our own money. And um, we 
we all bought muscle cars. And the first, the fir- I think the first one, one of my neighbors or one of my friends, he got a 67 Chevelle. And um, so it's the older, long, longer Chevelle. And I mean, we were like, oh man, this that's is awesome. It. This, this is, is it. awesome. <laughs> and then my next friend, um, I remember going with him. I think we went with him. Actually, I don't know if I went or not. I think my other buddy went with him to look at a car, and they went and looked at a 70 Plymouth GTX 440 six-pack, and his dad was very super nice guy, but very conservative, never really got upset. And this guy was selling this car, and my buddy had the money to buy it, and they test drove it. And that thing was so hot that you couldn't, you couldn't drive it and shift it and not have it squawk the tires because it just had so much power. <laughs> and I heard, uh, my buddy told me that they took it out and took it up the street and back. And his it, dad, his dad was like, hell no, no. Not hell no. <laughs> and when he said hell no, that it was a deal. So he didn't end up getting that, but he ended up getting a 70, a 71 charger and it had a 340 in it. And uh, that was a sweet car. And then um, I bought a 74 Camaro for $800, and it was the biggest pile of crap that you'd ever seen. It was green, and it was ugly. And but, I didn't know. I didn't know you bought it. You, like, I didn't know. Oh, you yeah, it, it, was, it was terrible. And so we ended up replacing both doors, both quarter panels, one front fender. I think everything else we were able to, to fix and was it a group was it a group effort no so um my parents were good friends with a family down by crawfordsville and their son was probably 20 years older than me 25 years older than me and he had a body shop Mm -hmm. and um i i convinced my parents more my mom um (laughs) i pretty much i pretty much uh I don't know what you want to say, but I you were the baby. So I was the baby and I took full advantage of it and I paid for a lot of it myself, but I know I finagled, I finagled a few dollars out of mom, and dad. I'm sure I did. I don't know how much, but anyway, we got it. We got it all redone and repainted. It had an interior that was red crushed velvet and black. It wasn't leather. I'm sure it was black vinyl. It looked like a whorehouse, but it was, oh, it was nice. And it was bright red. And the 350 that was in it, um, it it was bad. And so I bought a crate motor for it. And I, I bought a stroked 350 with a 400 crank turned down. So it was a 383. It was punched 30 over. It was a 383. And that thing, it, it ran, it ran really good. (laughs) Um, and well, so the, you can imagine what they got into, oh, um, was, high school. It was nuts. Well, this is what happened. So I got my, I got my permit, uh, the summer before. So let's see, I had turned 15 and got my permit going into my, I don't know what year that would have been, but anyway, um, I lost my license within I lost my license for too many speeding tickets within, I would say within three months by winter, I had lost my license because I had to ride. I had to, my buddy had to pick me up and take me to school. And then he was in wrestling and I'd have to hang out in town until, until he got done with wrestling, bring me, uh, bring me home. So yeah. And, and in the process, I tore the transmission out of it. It had a turbo 350 transmission, which wasn't near strong enough for what, what it was and so we took it to a transmission place and we swapped it out and put a turbo 400 in it that was built and then it threw the ring and pinion out of it and we ended up putting a we ended up putting uh a 10 bolt it was still a 10 bolt rear but we had it all built and anyway i mean i was a i was a motorhead i just we loved wrenching on stuff and and um we would that's funny. I bet the cops, they, when you got that, they were like, all right. Uh, and then you started bad. driving. And <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> then you were on the radar. <laughs> yeah, I was on the radar. Um, all your, I mean, I'm sure all your buddies were on the radar. I think they, they were. The one that had the 67, he was probably the, he was the least, he was the least heavy footed of any of us. And, and I'm not even going to, 
I won't go down this road very far, but we had another friend that had a 70 GTO with a 400 Pontiac in it. And that was a, that was a runner. And he had terrible luck with cars. I, I, we could do a whole podcast about uh, the luck of this guy. I mean, every vehicle he touched would end up just <laughs> getting destroyed. But that anyway, sucks. he had a GTO. That was a nice car. Um, just a lot of, you know, we had a great time cruising around. Gas was a buck. Uh, I think when I got my license that summer, gas was a maybe right around a dollar. And there was a Shell station in Washington that you could still get. You could still get ninety three octane um, fuel, which that's kind of what I needed because um, I had a little higher compression ratio. I ended up putting a barrel at the farm, and I would mix. 104 octane boost to get the to get the the octane level high enough to make my car run right or you know what i really don't know i thought i needed it i might not have but anyway um i think gas was yeah it was right around a buck it got up to like a buck 15 and we thought it was terrible but you know on on a good friday night you could burn a half a tank of gas in an hour if you really kept your jeez just going jeez okay so you had a lot of fun you and, your buddies, you and your buddies got a lot of cars. You had your three-wheelers. You all ran together at yeah. an early age. Yeah. What was your craziest legal story you can tell on this podcast that ever happened with that group of guys? Either middle school, high school, whatever. Um, that you're not going to get. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the statute trouble. of limitations is gone on all that. Um, I think probably the... I, I think probably the... Before you see your story, Dad, he kind of laid the groundwork there. But the stories that I heard, he was kind of a hellion. <laughs> you yeah, guys, we, we you guys tore some stuff up. We weren't too bad. Um, we nobody got hurt, and none of us did anything that was even close to being considered a felony or anything like that. We didn't steal anything. Um, we just had a, we had a lot of fun. We loved. We loved drag racing. We loved hunting. Um, we liked just messing around. Like, okay, so one of the things that we loved doing was at our high school in in the town we grew up with. It was a one way. It was a one way drive all the way around the school. So on one end of the school, the four lanes went by one end of the school pretty much. There's a few houses in between. But then when you turned and went up around the high school, that was all one way going around there. And at the end of the one way that met the four lanes there was a stop sign there that sat in a barrel it wasn't it was not it was in the middle of the street because it was two lanes wide because it Mm -hmm. was one way and you had to either go straight or right or left Left. you couldn't go straight if you were in the other you had to turn left yep and so we had a tradition at every basketball game in the fall when we left there we would flip that sign over every time which isn't very smart because after you do it two or three times not only the school but the local police know that somebody's going to turn that sign over but we weren't very bright you wanted to do it anyway well yeah and then even we wanted, when you were on the hit yeah, list you still did we it. wanted to do it and so that was one of the things that we did and and you know i'm not gonna god bless anybody that's a police officer that has to deal with young kids because and i i always said this with with Sawyer's friends, whenever they would come over, I would love to sit at the top stair if they were in the basement, or I would just sit on the deep freeze in the garage if they were all sitting outside by the pool. And I love to listen to the scheming. And I always told my wife, and I told them this too, all of them together is dumber than any of them (laughs) by themselves. And we were the exact same way. I mean, the stuff we thought up just stupid, just <laughs> stupid. And to be a cop, I just, the stories those guys have got to have, because the stuff kids come up with is just stupid. Especially in small towns. Yeah. You know, because, you know, well, you get bored doing right. the same thing. Right. So you're trying to do something else. So right. anyway, you know, we'd flip that sign, we'd flip that thing over. And then we got chased a few times. Um, and then um, probably the, probably the biggest, the biggest brouhaha that we ever got into was, One year, we were probably sophomores or juniors, and around Thanksgiving, there's an old road that goes out of town, 
um, it was it was the old it was the old highway, and then they they built a new highway uh, further north, and so it was the old highway, and it went out of town, and it went underneath a railroad overpass, and the overpass was too short to where semis like van trailers couldn't go under it. And I think that's probably part of the reason that they build a new road because it was right where there was a creek and they couldn't lower the road and the railroad wasn't going to raise the bridge. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was kind of a less traveled area, but a buddy of mine, they owned some ground out there and we got the idea. And I'm not even sure if it was really our deal, our idea, or it was his older brother's idea. And we kind of (laughs) took, Oh yeah. I think we took up the, the cause as his older brother graduated, we thought, oh, yeah, we're going to do that. So we would, every year we would make a dummy <laughs> and stuff, you know, stuff a pair of bib coveralls and a shirt with hay, and we would tie a rope around the dummy, and then we would go to this field, and we would get up on the railroad grade, and we would walk out onto the, onto the overpass and wait for somebody to come by, and then just as they were getting close, we would drop this dummy down <laughs> like we were some somebody was getting thrown off the bridge. And not very bright, not endorsing this because obviously bad things can happen. And we didn't think things very through. No one was ever injured doing this. No car wrecked. Do not attempt. Yeah, don't do this. This is not, yeah, this is, we're telling you this so that you know. You wouldn't not get to do away it. with it anyway if you even tried. So don't even right. try. Right. And um, this is the beautiful thing about the 80s. Right. And so usually what would happen is um, the time of night we were doing it, it's usually all young kids out, and they would either not stop or they would slam on their brakes. And if it was a car full of girls, they would yell something. And if it was some girl that we wanted to talk to or find out who it was, then we would all start yelling from the top of the overpass. And a few numbers might have even been gotten out of that deal. (laughs) I don't know. Or it would be some guys or someone, and they would be all pissed, you know, and they would they would tell you that, you know, come down here and we're going to beat your ass and all that. (laughs) And it would, it would, you know, it would, it never, it never turned into anything. They finally get tired and, and drive off because it's really a lot of work to try to get up the embankment. Um, and so we did that. And the first year we did it, it was like, oh yeah, it was awesome. And then the second year we were like, it's going to be bigger and better. So we made a bigger dummy or got a longer rope or we had it measured out just perfect so that when we dropped it, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't touch a car. It would be just above it, you know? And, um, but once again, we weren't very smart. And so enough people the first year had said, called the police and said, these guys are out there doing this. And so they, they were smart enough to think, you know, I bet you they do it again. So we're out there probably my junior year and we're dropping this dummy and few cars come by and we all think it's pretty funny. And then one of my friends is like, I think there's a train coming. <laughs> and we look down the, <laughs> down the tracks towards the town. And yeah, there's a light, you know, there's a light coming down the tracks. And you're like, well, yeah, it, it's not coming very fast. I don't fast. hear anything. <laughs> yeah, we don't hear anything. I'm like, I don't, something's not right. But yet, you know, we're not bright enough to think what could possibly, you know, it's got to be. And then finally it dawned on all of us, no, it was some person with a flashlight coming down the tracks. And it was a police officer coming down the tracks. And then we look the other way, and there's another flashlight coming the other way. (laughs) And on top of a railroad trussle, there is no, all it is is the railroad ties with the rails. There's nothing between them. So you have to step fairly Cautiously. Gingerly, cautiously, yeah. because if you step between them, you're going to break your ankle. <laughs> so you can't like really run. Right. You can trot quickly. So we figure out that, you know, bad things are coming and we take <laughs> off as quickly as we can. And we literally get to the edge of the, of the trussle and just dive off the side of it in the weeds rolling down the hill because a police officer is right there. One of my friends literally he had a hold of his 
shirt as he was going down the last the, guy the last guy <laughs> and um yeah it, it's kind of like the bear story when you're doing things stupid as kids you don't have to be the fastest you only have to be faster than the slowest kid that's the thing if as long as you can outrun one of your friends you're fine because because <laughs> that's the guy that's 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 it right he's there. the low-hanging fruit yeah, he's probably right. gonna get it anyway um it, you know they chased they chased after us and you know they're middle aged middle aged men, and we're really scared teenagers. So we got away, and um, it was all it was all fun. But um, there was a pretty serious investigation that went in, and um, let's just say that there were people within the community school system that had, had an a, idea, had a pretty good idea if they had to guess which group of young men. Uh, would be involved in such a thing they had kind of a short list and we were all brought in for questioning and we were set down and we were told the severity of what you know what was in front of us and usually I think that when you get there was at that point there's probably I know there was six of us there might have been eight of us but I think there was six and usually there's always a weak link and somebody cracks so, and all it takes is one person to crack. And that's what they were going after. They were trying to find the weak link. And none of us did. <laughs> none of us. We all had our story that's straight. That's some loyalty right we there. We were pretty loyal to each other. And uh, we had our own. We all had our story straight. And we stuck to it. And when it was all said and done. And don't get me wrong. We were all scared scared to death that, you know, the hammer was going to drop. And we were going to be in trouble and, and all that. And I will say this. This is an important part of, I guess, my upbringing is, and I think that's something that's missing today, and that's part of the reason that I think kids have a lot of problems with authority and getting into trouble. I was never, I was never afraid of what a police officer was going to do to me not that I didn't respect them, but I just didn't worry about if they, if somebody like that thought ill of me. And I never worried about what a teacher might do to me or think of me. But I was very worried about what Lawrence Whistler was going to do to me. <laughs> so if it came down to a deal where my parents got involved, yeah, I didn't want that to ever happen because... My dad, he was the heavy, and um, if he got involved, you knew it was going to be, it wasn't going to be a big, it wasn't going to be a good deal. And I actually got picked up for possession, um, same bunch of guys. We, we, We got some beer, and we were out in the country, and we were sitting in this, sitting in this vacant, uh, abandoned farm, uh, farmstead, and a car pulled in behind us. And it was the local county deputy, and it was on a, it was on a Saturday night. Not much going on in the fall of the year, and um, none of us were of age. We were all we were all uh, eighteen, except for me and one of my friends had late birthdays, so we were seventeen. And anyway, we ended up getting possession tickets, and my parents had to come pick me up from the police station. And uh, there was eight of you, but. <laughs> You got to you got to finish Yeah, the story. so this is a good story. This is a really good story. So This will be the last one and he'll finish his point, but this, yeah. this is too good not to yeah, put it. Yeah. So <laughs> So he gets us all out of the car <laughs> and um he knew us from he just knew us cuz <laughs> we were known. And um he lines us up and he gives us all a breathalyzer test. Um because he knew we were underage and we all had had some beer and um he gonna write us up and he's he's got to go get his he goes back to the car to get his ticket book and one of my friends is standing next to me and he just says he says i'm not getting a ticket i'm getting the hell out of here (laughs) and he literally just turns around and takes off running (laughs) runs right out the driveway right across the ditch into the field and he lived about, I'd say he lived about three and a half miles straight south of where we were. <laughs> he ran all the way home. But the funniest part of the whole thing was this guy gets out of the car and he comes back and he looks 
And then he looks down, he starts writing the first ticket, and he looks back up, <laughs> and he says, wasn't there, wasn't there six of you? I think it was six of us. I think there was six of us. And he goes, wasn't there six of you? And we all go, mm, no. And he's like, no, there were six of you. And we go, no, no, just, just us. And <laughs> then he just kind of took it at, at face value and just kept going. And anyway. That's back to the loyalty part, though. Yep. Never ratted. Yeah. Well, you know, there wasn't any reason to. But um, so my dad, I, you know what? I didn't really get punished that much because I, I had to get up and work every day anyway. But he told me how disappointed he was in me and um, how that when that came out in the paper – that it wasn't a reflection on me because I was just a young kid. It was a reflection on him and that I needed to think more about how what I did affected my family and not just me. And I think that was the first time that I had ever thought, um, even thought about that. Right. And so, you know, um, that was a teachable moment and I learned something from it. But you're saying... Were you saying that kids don't really fear their parents much anymore? Yeah, yeah. so that, you know, that today, um, today I feel like that children, parents want to be their kid's friend, which is great. Um, I want to be my kid's friend. But at the end of the day, it's not, it's not the public's job to raise my kids, it's not the teacher's job to raise my kids. It's the teacher's job to teach them. And it's not the policeman's job to raise my kids. It's the policeman's job to uh, <laughs> enforce stop, the law. <laughs> enforce the law. And if my kid's breaking the law, then I'm, I'm the one that needs to know about it, and I'm the one that needs to discipline them. And I feel like it swung the other way, where we expect, society expects all these people outside of the home to basically raise their kids for them. And it that doesn't and those people don't have any credibility with these kids, so they don't have any respect. And then on the parent side, you know, they want to be their buddy. And so it doesn't work. And Mm-mm. so you end up with a generation of people that um are pretty are pretty confused about um responsibility and respect. And respect and how hard it is um to regulate themselves. They they don't know how to regulate themselves because and that you know that's a hard thing. Discipline's not easy and I'm not going to get in the whole, you know, corporal punishment or or anything like that. And it doesn't even have to get into that, but I knew like I said, I was never worried about anything. I was never worried about a teacher or some person as far as what they were going to do to me or what they thought of me, but I definitely worried about what my mother and father thought of me and, and what my dad was going to do to me. Because <laughs> dynamite, dynamite comes in small packages, and he, yeah, he was like dynamite. So, <laughs> anyway. So, but we, you know, we had a great time, and I'm friends with all those guys to this day. Um, and when we, um, when we get together, you know, it's, it's one of those, there's not very many people that you can that you share as many like it's like being it's probably a lot like guys that are in the army together or something like that when you spend that much uh, life experience together you just you kind of learn enough about each other that there's a bond there and it's pretty neat and and i don't feel like it's probably the same as it is now like i mean i'm obviously friends with my high school buddies and we'll be close for a long time but I think it was, it's, you got, you guys probably have a little bit of that connection, closer bond just because the world has changed so much and it's not what it used to be at all. Like it's significantly different. So like you can share those, you can share that. If we were to do that today, I would have been in, we would have probably got the whole book thrown at us, but you guys got, we're in the time where they weren't so strict and it wasn't such a big deal. And yeah, you get to share that. You guys shared that more than. Yeah, we didn't really any touch. generation really got to. I yeah. mean, we didn't really touch on that, and that's something else that I think is a negative of where we are today. Um, did we get away with more than what we should have? Yeah, we did. Um, and there were people that probably did things more destructive than what we did that actually hurt people that probably got away with more than what they should. However, um, 
there's something to be said. Today, there's not much tolerance for people that are not mature. And you you do not, it's like it, we talk about, we talk about betting on yourself and we talk about, um, you know, learning by mistakes. Well, when you're a kid, I feel like kids today are held to such a high standard that if they mess up, it dictates how they're looked at for their whole life. Mm-hmm. And and we saw it, uh, we saw that kid, the kid that had the the sign during the, I think it was during the wave. Remember the bush light guy, the kid that had yeah. the picture? Yeah. Um, and, you know, everybody thought it was, oh, he was great, you know, such a great thing. And then they went rooting back through his tweets and he had some tweet or something he put on Facebook like three years before that when he would have been like 16 or 17 years old mm-hmm. that was derogatory towards somebody. And they just went after him. Well, Oh, the, Carson King. Yeah, the... Yeah. He the Des Moines Register went after him, which the Des Moines Register is a trash publication, so I don't have much standard for that. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. it, that's just an example. He did so much good, and then you he yeah. go back to when he was a kid, and they just totally destroy you for it. Yeah, and you can't... I'm sorry, but you... Um, you know, Joe Rogan talks about... He teaches his daughters about kids having mushy brain, and that's because you're not... You're not... You're especially men... They mature a little slower, and when you're that age, you're not – who you are then is not who you're going to be, and what you do you, – I'm sorry, but you should not be held liable um, for that. Well, I mean, unless you do something crazy bad, but like – Yeah. Yeah, I get – I totally get what you mean. No one yeah. wants to make a mistake, and when you right. make a mistake, not only do people around you blow up on you, but, I mean, internally you probably blow up on yourself too, and then that's why you get these kids that are – feel like they got to always be perfect yep. all the time everything they got to yep. do what their parents tell them they got to do what the society tells them and then when they mess up and they never failed in their life yeah it could turn tragic it destroys because, them yeah it totally destroys them yeah so the long story short i think that might be one of the things that we don't really think about that much but we were actually one of the last generations where i feel like you could make some mistakes and somebody whether it be your parent, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a coach, whether it be a police officer, gave you the benefit of the doubt. And gave and, you another chance. And gave you another chance. Don't do it again. And you know what? Yeah, mis- and we always talk about this too. Mistakes are learning lessons. If you don't make yeah. mistakes, you don't fail, you don't mess up, you're never going to learn from it. I've learned way more from my mistakes than I have from, yeah. from what I've done right. And obviously, don't don't commit a felony because yeah if you commit a felony that's a big mistake and you're gonna get <laughs> oh yeah you're gonna get freaking the book thrown at you but yeah. if you make a mistake nowadays it seems like it's just yeah like on the felony level but yeah. so um i made it through i made it through high school um barely i just barely made it through i had the i had the bad uh i had the good fortune bad fortune that one of my best friends that i got to be not he wasn't I didn't know him when I was a child or young young but we got to be good friends through high school um he actually had I would say he had a photographic memory and I did not and um it made for difficult uh difficult studies my senior year because um I my grade point average suffered terribly and um he did, he did pretty well, and I just barely made it out. I'll just say that. But anyway, we got through high school, and um, I knew what I wanted to do, but at that time, everybody, that was when everybody was starting to go to college. And my oldest brother had gone to the University of Colorado, followed my dad, He had a degree in business. He had graduated, and he had a job in Denver, and he was making good money, and he, you know, thought he had the world. I thought he had the world by the tail. And my other brother, um, he had not gone to college, but he 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 was in a Christian singing group that traveled around, and they'd been to Russia, and they'd been to Europe, and he was doing... He was doing that, and he had gotten done with that and was living in California, um... And I don't think he knew what he wanted to do. And I knew that, and that didn't appeal to me. So I felt like I needed to do something. And so I went to community college. Um, I went to Kirkwood Community College. Yeah, <laughs> Kirkwood. And, and I, it's a good, that's a good, um, 
if you want a cheap if you want a cheap two year education to transfer to a four year school, it's an excellent program, and they've done they've done great things. I just was not a good student, and I didn't have uh, good motives of going there. The most valuable thing that I learned there was how to drink beer out of a funnel with a garden hose because I hadn't done that till I went to Kirkwood. I had a really good time there, but I didn't really learn anything. And the problem was that all I really wanted to do was farm. Well, you also, I remember you telling me this too, like seeing uh, your older brother do business, that intrigued you a little yep. bit. Like you didn't know if you wanted to do a little bit of business or you wanted to... Yeah. come back and farm. So I feel like if we self-reflect on these great 50 years you've had, yeah, I think you've always kind of, you went to school wasn't for you. You weren't really a good student because it just didn't interest you. And I was the same way. I just was trying to get by and I didn't care really because it, it just didn't fill me up. But you always, you always liked farming. You always liked business and that intrigued you. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that that was at the time too, that my father, my dad, um, our relationship wasn't the best at that point. It was probably, you know, about as bad as it would get being a teenager of that age where you think you know everything and you've got a really old father who's pretty conservative and you don't think he knows anything. And so, you know, I this was at the very beginning of the expansion in the hog business and guys were starting to get bigger. And I, I, I think that if I was a little bit um, I think if I was a little more sure of myself and not as intimidated with my dad, I probably would have set them both down and said, you know, I, all I want to do is stay here and farm. And I think we can make this deal work. Um, but I didn't do that. I went to Kirkwood for a year and then I realized really quick when I was up there that, um, the best the best way for me to make my way in the world was do what I had passion for. And I didn't really have passion for business as far as going to work for some company. Um, I wanted, I wanted to farm. I wanted to raise pigs and I knew that it was changing and I knew that guys were growing and, um, I felt like it was time. It was time to kind of pick. Yep. Decide. decide. And so I came home that spring, and um, I think if I wouldn't have decided to stay home, somebody at Kirkwood probably would have called and said, I, "You need he, to get out." <laughs> he doesn't really need to come back. <laughs> um, but so I stayed home and um, started farming with my dad, and we had 160 sows, fair to finish, and that was right when uh, we'd had pseudo rabies. And um, what is that? It was kind of like pseudo rabies was kind of the forerunner. I guess I'd say it's a little like what PERS is it's today. A, so it's a disease for yeah. pigs. It's a disease for pigs. And they had a really hard time eradicating it. So there was a vaccine for it. And were your pigs outside at the time? No, we were all, we were all inside. We okay. had all our pigs in confinement. Um, so our first hog buildings were built um, 72 and then 74 and 75. And mm -hmm. so we were fair to finish, but we had all the pigs on one site. And um, I convinced my dad, and we had all farmers hybrid, farmers hybrid, which is out of business today. And uh, if anybody out there has a large farmer site, a farmers hybrid bore power sign that they would like to part with, I would love to talk to you because I've been trying to find one for years. What what was that? So it was a genetics company. Oh, okay, but they were a they were a they were a whole different. So PIC DeKalb were two of the big companies then, and they were taking the hogs leaner. They were using York Landrace sows, and basically they they were pushing the idea of using that white female, and then they were using a, a Hamp Duroc cross boar. Um, farmers hybrid, and they were more on lean. They were geared towards getting a pig leaner mm -hmm. um, because that was the whole beginning of pork, the other white meat. We thought we were going to have to compete with chicken, and so we had to get these pigs leaner. We had to get them leaner. Well, we ended up getting them too lean, and the meat lost its flavor, and that's why we're back where we are That's today. why we're not in Chick-fil-A. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, really, that's it. They took the shortcut. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, they worked hard on it. Yeah. It just, it wasn't, didn't turn out to be. Yeah, it's not a shortcut, but it's just a wrong decision. Farmer's Hybrid was, they had a lot of Poland China, Duroc, Hamp. They didn't have a lot of white color in them. 
Mm-hmm. And in their heyday, people were buying pigs on yield, not on percent lean. Mm-hmm. And farmers hybrid farmers hybrid were very good for that uh, yield, not on Explain percent. So yield to someone that has so no yield idea is, what that means. Yield is basically if you take a pig and you weigh that pig live, and he weighs two. Just say he weighs three hundred pounds. He weighs 300 pounds, and then you take everything off the pig that isn't meat, that you can't sell as meat. So you take, you can sell just about everything but the squeal out of a pig, but (laughs) if you take all the bone, you take the bones out that aren't included in the rib cut um, or bone-in ham or whatever that, you take the skin off. All that stuff. You take, yeah, all that stuff off. So what's left? What's left, and you divide what's left by the total weight, the difference is the yield. Okay. So they were all about that selling point. 77% yield. Mm-hmm. Well, then people started wanting to talk about how much fat was in the meat, how thick the fat was around the loin, and percent lean. So they came up with this idea of selling pigs grade and yield. So grade and yield um, was the percentage was the yield, but also the grade was how lean. Mm-hmm. And that was when they had the lean-o-meter. They had, so they started coming out with technology. Technology started making its way into these plants where they had a machine that um, measured that. the fat, measured the back fat. Okay, farmer's hybrid. And then farmer's hybrid, they had problems with pseudo-rabies, and they had a heck of a time getting it out. Anyway, basically, they were old technology. Yeah. They were old technology. They didn't, they didn't innovate. They didn't innovate, and so they ended up going out of business, basically. But we we were all farmers hybrid, and then when I came home, I convinced my dad that we should go repop, depop. So we got rid of all the pigs, washed everything out, let it set, and we repropped. We brought in Cambro 15 gilts from PIC, and we bred them. And then the other thing we changed was at that time we were continuously farrowing. So literally what we did is every week we would go over to the, to the sow building and my dad would walk through and we'd look, we'd look at the sows and we'd find all the ones that we thought were going to farrow that week and we'd count them up and then we'd go to the farrowing house and we'd be like, all right, well, we need to move this many sows make, out. Yeah, when you make space. So then we'd go over to the finishing building and we'd look at all the pigs and we'd be like, well... This is how many pigs we think we can sell. I think we can sell, you know, these four pens out of the finisher. So we'd call up. You had to constantly be making space for what yep. was happening at the sow barn. So every week we would sell how many pigs we needed to to Oscar Meyer in Washington. And um, we, if that was one straight truck load or if it was two straight truck loads, whatever it was, and then we'd move pigs from our grower to our finisher, from our nursery to our grower, and then we'd wean however many pigs – take those sows out, wash that many crates, and then we'd put in those sows. And sometimes it worked really good, and then sometimes we would find a, pit, find a sow that we missed that farrowed in the, in the pen, and we would get all the pigs gathered up, and then we'd quick, we'd quick double up pigs, and, you know, it was, it was something. But that's how, you know, that's how we did it. We did, it was continuous, continuous flow. Mm-hmm. And we went to grouping them. We bred them in groups, and then we started preg checking, and we started – keeping better records and we started getting better, you know, getting better at, at doing it, keeping track of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, um, we, that was in, uh, and uh, were you making good money? Was that the way it was, that was a good way off your grain farming operation is to, yeah, we were feeding the corn to the pigs and, you know, my dad had raised us three boys, put us through school, bought us cars, um, all that off of basically off of 160 acres and 160 sows, fair to finish. Yep. So and it was a good business. It was a good, great business. It was. It. And nobody kept good. Well, we didn't keep good records. All right. we knew was when we needed money, we sold pigs and, or we needed the room. We sold pigs. I mean, that's pretty much how we went. We got the pigs as big as we could get till we needed the room. Right. Um, and then my dad got the opportunity to buy the Meek Place, which that's where our site two or our site one is, and that's where your building is. Yep. We got the opportunity to buy 240 acres that had been in the family um, up the chain a ways, and we bought that. Um, and that was in about 80, I want to say that was 88. I think that was like when I was a junior. And um, so I'll tell you a good story. Um, 
in ninth. So I came back and we did that and we'd gone, you know, a couple and you, years. And you were like, this is it. This is, this is what I needed. This is yep. And I thought we're going to make, this thing's going to go. And I wanted to get bigger. I wanted to get bigger. So there was a neighbor of ours that he had a, he had a, a little place about four miles away from us and he had 120 sows, fair to finish. And he raised breeding stock for Premier. And well, his name was Gary Ledger. So if any of you that are listening, Gary, Gary, I think is working. I think he still works for PSI, but he lives up in West Des Moines. But anyway, Gary is grew up here and was a neighbor of mine. And anyway, he he found an opportunity to buy a place over by Williamsburg. And so he was selling his farm, big four square house, and he had 120 sows for her to finish. And I was like, that's the thing to do. That's the thing to do. And I was dating my wife at the time. And we went and looked at it, and she was she was eager to get out of her parents' house, and I was eager to you know Live blaze <laughs> blaze yep blaze my own trail, and um we were banking the bank that we were banking with was very high on the hog business, and we could make it cash flow, and my grandpa gave me ten thousand dollars to help with the down payment. And we bought that in the fall of 1992. And then Trish and I got married fall of 1993. We moved in there first of January, and we lived in sin for uh, eight months. And, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that's right, because yeah, we got married that fall. And... I bought my gilts and I kept them down here at this place. In fact, I kept them in this barn and we fair, we bred down here. And when I moved in in January and we moved the sows up there, I started farrowing like in February. So you had sows and he had, and yep. grandpa had sows. We both had sows and, um, 140 here and 140 there, 160 there and hundred or 160 here and 120 up there. Okay. And, um, that was in 93. And, uh, if any of you remember, 92 going into 93 hogs were about seventy dollars, seventy dollars a hundred weight, and we were making great money. And I was twenty, I was twenty three in ninety, I was twenty two in ninety two. Um, so I thought I had the world by the tail, and we cash flowed all that at forty two dollars or something like that. And man, it was going to work so good, and we did. Um, and then. We went, we went through 94, and then we came to 95. And 95, hog market went to crap. Hog market crashed. Yeah, it went, it went to crap. And it didn't go, it wasn't terrible, but it was pretty bad. So how many years did you do it so you had your sows and grandpa had his too? So 93 to so 95. Like two years, two years. And two. that was, you were like, oh yeah, I made the right decision. Yep, yep. And, and like this is great. And you know what? Here's the other thing, though. I was, um, we nobody told us. Like it's so weird. Like we got married and we set up house, and all of my schooling of of her and m me and my parents and her parents, nobody ever set us down and told us you need to save all the money you can. Don't buy anything stupid. And I grew up in a family where my mom, my dad worked all the time, and he didn't do the books. My mom did. And if we had the money, he didn't care what you bought. And if we didn't have the money, we didn't buy it. But when I was spoiled, I was spoiled rotten. And when Trish and I got married, we, we lived... I mean, we didn't live extravagantly at all because we knew we didn't have money, but as far as eating out and as far as if we wanted a new shirt or we wanted this or that, we didn't worry about it. And if Von Marr was giving you a charge card, well, yeah, give me a charge card. Mm -hmm. And and it all worked fine till the hog market started going to crap, and then things got really tight. And because we never had the conversation, um, things got really hard between us because my because my wife so so Trisha she didn't grow up on a farm she didn't know anything about it she didn't know anything that went on and she had balanced her own checkbook when she was going to school 
and buying her own gas and all that. But the numbers that I wrote, the bills that I wrote, the feed bill, the bill for guilt, the bill for LP, all that, she was just like, the numbers were huge to her Mm -hmm. and she was just overwhelmed. And so she basically just left it to me to do it all. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was tough because so 95 hits. 95 hits. Not that bad of a crash, but it was a crash. It was bad enough that we got concerned. We got woke up. Yep. And my dad and I knew that we had to figure out a more efficient way to do it. And so we made the decision that we were going to put all the sows down here mm-hmm. and take our nurseries out and move them to my place. And then we were still going to finish at both sites because we had finishers at both sites. So we combined the sows and we had 240 sows fair to finish is what we had here. And, um, we, we'd haul the pigs up there and, um, nursery them. And then if we needed to finish them, we'd haul them back down here and, or up either, whichever place. Yeah. If you needed to bring them down here, you would yeah. to finish them out. Um, and we, that worked pretty good. Um, but purrs, we started getting purrs. That was when that all started and it was hard to keep sows bred. Um, we were, you know, we were pen mating pigs and we started AI and pigs and there was a group of guys that started a boar stud and we bought a boar and put it in the stud and we started AI and, and, but we, our conception rate wasn't good and we had, we had problems here and there. And so production, the production was never great. It was, it was okay. But then we got into 98 and 98 was just an absolute train wreck. And at one point, 98, I was pretty sure that I was going to lose the farm up there, that my wife was going to leave me, um, and I wasn't sure whether or not my parents, who were, my dad was, by by normal standards, my dad was elderly at that point. He wasn't because he worked, he was, he could outwork me, but mm-hmm. um, it was stressful. It was very stressful. And So, 98 was another... And 98 was the wake-up call that this deal wasn't going to work. 